Welcome to Grace. Let's pray one more time before we look at the word together. Let's pray. Father, would you pray for the teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit? Or would you really cause this to be a time where you really work in our marriages? You also work in those who are headed toward marriage by causing us to really line up with your order that we might experience your fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. So there was this guy, and he's laying in bed, and he's dying. His wife is sitting in a chair next to him, and he whispers to his wife, before I die, I have something to confess to you. Shh, not now, she replies. But I need to tell you, I cheated on you, he admits. Yes, I know, she replies. I need to clear my conscience before I die. Shh, she counters. Just lie back and let the poison work. <laughs> well, on this Valentine's Day, we want to talk about marriage. How did God really design it to work? Last week, we started a series called God's Grand Story. And we began by looking at the beginning, by looking at the creation account. And we learned a lot about how God works from the creation account. We saw in Genesis 1, verse 2, that God took that which was formless and void and darkness covered the earth. And he began to make it something new. The first three days of the six days of creation, God began to move everything from formlessness to form. Or we could say from disorder to order. Then the next three days, God moves everything from a state of void or emptiness to a state of fullness. This is typically the way that God works. <clears throat> when God is making something new, or even when he is making someone new, he moves first us from a state of disorder to a state of order before he can move us from a state of emptiness to a state of of fullness. God's desire for all of us is fullness. And so fullness only comes, though, when we have our lives moved from disorder to order, which is essentially repentance. You go in one way and it's totally out of order. Repentance is to turn, do a 180 and go God's way, follow his order. Why? So we can experience his fullness. So that's what one of the takeaways last week from Genesis chapter one is how God works. Now, when we get to chapter 2 of Genesis, we see that God makes a man. He makes Adam. But even though he makes man perfectly, there's still something lacking in the fullness of what God wants for man. So he's going to remedy that by making Eve, making this specific woman Eve. And then he's going to bring her to him. She's going to bring Eve to Adam. Now, here we have the institution of marriage is established. In Genesis chapter 2, one man married to one woman joined together. That was God's plan from the beginning. And there was a certain order God had in mind and how they would live that would bring about fullness. And remember, it's God's desire that every marriage have fullness. That's his desire. But every the marriage, is, if it's going to have fullness, must follow God's order. If there's disorder, then there will be emptiness instead of fullness. So what we're going to see here now when we get to Genesis chapter 2 is we're going to see what God's order is. And then we're going to see the result of that, of course, is fullness. So we really want to, to be marriages, have marriages that really follow his order so we can experience the fullness. So we're going to walk through the passage of Genesis 2. But let me start by the last verse of Genesis 1. Here we go. Genesis 1, verse 31. And God saw all that he had made. Behold, it was very good. And there's evening and there's morning, the sixth day. Now we get to chapter 2, and we're going to go right to verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. Now again, remember that God's desire is for all marriages to experience fullness. And he saw that it was not good for man to be alone, and he's going to remedy that situation. But I want you to notice that the first not good thing mentioned in the Bible is loneliness. 
Loneliness is the first not good thing that we read about in the whole Bible. You know, it's interesting to me that this, we've really gone through this, uh, these, this two years of COVID where there's been so much loneliness and isolation and so many people just living life online. And I'm so glad, I praise God, that that time is, for the most part, come to an end and is coming to an end where people do not have to stay isolated. They do not have to stay in isolation, experience loneliness. They can come back to church. They can get back in life groups. They can have face-to-face -face time again and really experience community. And I'm just thankful to God that that season is over for so many people. Why? Because loneliness is not good. And there's been way too many people, way too lonely for way too long. So it's the first not good thing mentioned in the Bible. So God's going to remedy it in, in Genesis chapter 2 by providing not just a woman for a man. This isn't some generic woman for some generic man. This is Eve for Adam. He's going to provide, he's going to fix this problem. He, so he calls this solution a helper suitable. Now the word helper is not a demeaning word at all. In fact, the, Greek, the Hebrew word translated helper or helpmate here is the same Hebrew word as translated when it's in, in the Old Testament referring to Yahweh, Almighty God, as our helper. So it can't be a demeaning term if it refers to Yahweh God as our helper. What it means is someone who can provide something for us that we're unable to provide for ourselves. And God is that way for us, and, this, and Eve is going to be that for Adam. She's going to be able to provide for him when he cannot provide for himself. That's how she is going to be the helper. But she's going to be a helper suitable for him. Literally, the word here means of the complement of. I don't know how many of you guys saw the old Rocky movie where Rocky meets Adrian, and before they get married, he says of Adrian, he says, he says, I got gaps, and she fills my gaps. I thought, what a theologically accurate statement. <laughs> it's true. Basically, what he's saying is, she is the complement of me. She's suitable for me. She fills my gaps. And so, God is going to make Eve for Adam. Now, right after he announces that he's, that this, no, no, he notices a problem, he's going to fix it, he then gives Adam an assignment. It seems odd. And he's, he's going to make Eve for Adam, but then he gives Adam an assignment before he actually does it. And the assignment is basically that he's going to name all the creatures that God has made, and God's going to bring by him, he names them. Creatures, birds, all of them. Genesis 2.19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So it's just curious. Why would God give this assignment to Adam before he brings Eve, before he makes her and brings her to him? I think God's doing two things here in preparing Adam for Eve. I think the first thing he's doing is in naming the animals Adam is doing something very important. In the ancient world, if one kingdom conquered a city, it would rename the city to show that that city was now under the authority of that kingdom. And so God has given Adam the responsibility of naming all the animals. This is a leadership exercise. He's going to rule over all the animals. That was part of God's plan. He's going to govern so God is going to have them name him, and he's beginning to actually lead in this role. I think God is preparing Adam to be a loving leader in his relationship. But I think he's doing more than that, because it says, but for Adam, there is not found a helper suitable for him. So here he is, he's naming, he's noticing all these animals he's naming, and he notices that they, they're paired up with one just like them. But there's no one just like him. There's not a helper suitable for him. I think he emotionally is being prepared at this point. I think he feels his aloneness acutely. And, in, and that's good, actually, because he's feeling his need. He's going to be very appreciative of the gift he's given when God brings Eve to him. He's being prepared, I think, mentally and 
emotionally for what God is about to do. And for some of you that are single, that long to be married, or maybe even on the pathway to marriage specifically, and you're feeling your aloneness, Julie, I want you to see that today as part of God preparing you to receive what he's about to give you. So you will really appreciate it and be grateful for it. So verse 21, so next step, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. So God put Adam to sleep and it says literally in Hebrew, he took from the side of him. And so we've just understood that over the many, many years that it was a rib from the side of him. And, and then, he see, and then he closes up that place. So he doesn't need anesthesia anymore, divine anesthesia. So I think Adam's probably awake. Now watching God make Eve, which I think would have been one amazing moment. And so he is watching God make Eve for him. Now verse 22 and the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Now, it's interesting here, when you're doing Bible study, you, you notice that there's two different words used here for how God made a man and how God made a woman. And so you can look that up in a concordance and find out, and you can look it up in a dictionary and find out a little bit about what these words mean and what's the significance, because there is a significance. When God made a man, he used, there's a word used of just a very basic kind of a pot and a potter. Uh, but when God made woman, he uses a different Hebrew word, and it's of an architect and an ornate building. And so there's two different words because God made man and woman different. Now, most of you at this point are thinking, well, duh. But this is actually very important that we get this point, that God intentionally made man and woman to be different. I don't know how many times in a counseling, a marriage counseling situation I've been in where I said to the guy, I said, you know, your, you know, your problem is not that you married Sue or Mary or Betty, but your main problem is you married a woman. And then I tell the woman, I said, your main problem is not that you married Steve or John or Bubba, but your problem is you married a man. And until you guys accept the difference of what a man and a woman are like, which is the majority of your conflict is over, until you accept that, you're, you're going to have a frustrated marriage. See, it's so important that we really accept that. Accept that God, you know, made man and woman different. And just, not just accept it, but celebrate the difference. And just, you know, and be able to, you'll, you'll really reduce your conflict by about 80% if you just accept that she did it this way because she's a woman, or he did it this way because he's a man. Accept it. So that's what we see here. So God makes E for Adam. And then it says, and then he brought her to him. By the way, all this is in poetry in Hebrew. And this is really a beautiful wedding scene. God is walking Eve down the aisle. He brings her to Adam and gives her his hand, the hand in marriage. But I, I think it's important to note, again, it wasn't a generic man and a generic woman. He made Eve for Adam and brought her to him. And God is the same today, yesterday, now, and forever. I believe, he still, I believe, makes somebody for somebody and brings them to them. I believe God is still doing what he did. The very first a couple, I think he still is, is uh, making somebody specifically designed for somebody else and brings them to them. Now, I believe this is really important that we believe this and again, this will greatly enhance our marriages if we believe this to be true. Let me tell you why. I believe that God brought Tracy to me. I believe he made her for me and brought her to me. Now, what is that? what's the significance of that? The significance is that when things aren't going well, and believe it or not, Tracy and I do have arguments. You know, I tell people that, and they're like, oh, gosh, what's wrong? You know, we live in the same planet you live. When things aren't going well, it is important for me to believe that God brought me, made her for me and brought her to me. And if there was somebody better for me than her, he would have brought her to me. Therefore, I don't, bring, I don't at that point begin to think, gosh, I wish I had married someone else. Because if someone else was better for me, that's who God would have brought to me. And so when I really believe that, wait a second, he already brought the one he made for me, I accept that, and I don't 
daydream about, oh, golly, I wish I should have, maybe I could have married them or them. This is why I hate Facebook. <laughs> Do you know how many thousands and thousands of affairs have happened because of Facebook? Because somebody is having a little bit of stress in their marriage, and then they start to dream about, I wonder how so-and-so back in high school I dated or college. I wonder how, let me check and see what, huh? And then they connect with them, and they meet up with them thousands and thousands of times. I've had, I have some friends that you know, were missionaries that this happened because of this. They began to just think that way, and they're thinking wrong. It's so important that we just believe this first truth that God, you know, you, you that are married here and you are married online, that you got to believe the way second God brought this person to me and if there's someone better for me, you brought that person and accept that and believe it even when things are not going well. Believe it. And that'll keep you from going the wrong direction in your thinking. All right, notice what happens next, verse 23. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Actually said, wow, man after he saw her, but woman. Okay. Because she's taken out a man, verse 24. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall cleave to his wife, and listen to this, and they shall become one flesh. So when a man and woman are married, they are one flesh. When a man and woman consummate their marriage, they are one flesh. That means they can still be walking around in two bodies, have two personalities, two different names, but something has happened that they are now one. What does that mean? The main thing that means, being one flesh, is that there are no longer any win-lose situations. You either win, win, or lose, lose, because you're one flesh. If, the, if, if, the, if your spouse loses, you lost. So if you want to win, you've got to make sure they win. This is the most important truth I know about marriage. The most important truth any marriage counselor can tell any couple is this truth. You are now one flesh. You cannot win-lose anymore. You will win-win, or you will lose-lose. You can talk about an argument. If, if the argument is you won and your spouse lost, then you both lost. So you've got to figure out how to make sure you both win in that argument if you want to win. In finances, if one, of, one spouse loses in a financial decision, then you both lost. So you've got to figure out how to make sure both, both win in a financial decision. Physical intimacy, same thing. One loses, you both lost. You can apply this truth to every part of marriage. Every part of marriage if you're either going to win-win or lose-lose, but you will not win-lose anymore because you are one flesh. So what, here, here's why we know this is the most important principle about marriage. Because in Ephesians chapter 5, when the Apostle Paul teaches about the role of the husband and the role of the wife, he bases the whole teaching on the one flesh principle. Let me show you. Ephesians 5, verse 31 through 33. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The Apostle Paul is quoting the one flesh principle out of Genesis 2. Verse 32, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. He's talking about how Christ and the church, we can learn a lot about that relationship from a marriage that's, that, you know, when a husband and wife live it out rightly. But now notice what he says in verse 33. Nevertheless... Let each individual among you, he's talking to men here, love his own wife, even as himself. And let the wife see to it that she respect her husband. So Paul quotes the one flesh principle as a foundation for how husband and wife are to function. And because Paul understands that a married couple is going to either win-win or lose-lose, he's now going to tell them how to make sure they win-win. How do they win-win? The way you win-win in a marriage is that the wife must feel loved by the husband and the husband must feel respected by the wife. If the husband loves his wife and she, she really feels loved, then she wins. If the husband's respected by his wife, he really feels respected, then he wins. So that is how you win-win in a marriage. Now, it's interesting. Psychologists have determined through observation that a woman's self-esteem is built up primarily by whether or not she feels loved or not. And a man's self-esteem is built up primarily on whether or not he feels respected or not. By self-esteem, I simply meant when you feel satisfied, you feel fulfilled 
you feel happy. So the way a woman really feels satisfied and fulfilled and happy is when her husband is convincing her how much he loves her through all kinds of means. And the way the man feels satisfied and happy is when the wife is convincing him that he, she respects him by all kinds of ways and means. And then it begins to just win, 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 win. It just continues to cycle upward and upward. So that's how it's supposed to work. The husband is supposed to show his wife he loves her, and then she's happy. She's so, she's so satisfied. She respects him. He feels so satisfied and happy. He loves her more. He, she's even happier. She respects him more. He's even happier. And do that for years, do that for decades, and something called romance builds and builds and builds. And romance is way more than sex. But it builds over time by win-winning. But let me tell you what most couples do. Most couples do the exact opposite. They lose-lose. How does that work? The wife doesn't feel loved by her husband. She's not happy. She doesn't respect her husband. He's not happy. He loves her less. She's even less happy. She respects him less. He's even less happy. Lose, 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 lose. And then after decades of doing that, they call, you know, they meet with me or another pastor and basically want us to fix it in an hour. Let me tell you what I do with couples, you know, when I do marriage counseling. I want to give you a picture of it. Someone asked, Mike and Adrian Brown, would y'all come up here and be my guinea pigs? Come on up here and just sit right up here. Did you tell her you, you volunteered for this? Adrian, you could forgive them later for this. <laughs> okay, as you guys are coming up to sit up here, I want to read a verse to you guys. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says this. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil a place or an opportunity. Literally, it says a place. Don't give a place for the devil. You guys come right up here and sit and leave an empty chair between you, would you? I'm going to show you what I do in, in, in the marriage counseling situation. When it says, don't let the sun go down upon your anger, the, the, whole, the whole idea is that you have unresolved anger. You have resentment. You have unforgiveness in your marriage. Okay? What happens when you do that is you've got, you've got this giant reservoir of resentment that you're carrying week after week, month after month, year after year. It's like an ammunition dump of weapons. And what happens in the middle of a fight is you can reach back any time and grab a weapon and go, I got it, and you never, and you always. See, what happens is you've got this reservoir of resentment. You've got unforgiveness. But something else happens when you do that is you gave the devil a place. Okay, I need a devil. Do I have a devil handy? Where's the devil? Come on out, devil. All right, so we got a devil. All right, come up here and take your seat, devil. Okay, now, I, I want to do this because I want you to see the devil because when he's invisible, it's harder to get the point. But in real life, he's invisible. But here's what happens. Now, if you've got unforgiveness in your marriage, then you gave a place for the devil. The word devil means one who separates. And you gave him a place. The one who separates has a place that you gave him by not forgiving your spouse. So what happens? Then the smallest little thing, you can have the smallest disagreement, and it is just, it's just gasoline's poured on it because you gave a place to the devil, and all of a sudden you got a big fight. One little thing, and big fight. Why? Because you gave a place for the devil. And I tell you, so if I'm talking to a couple, yeah, I, could, yeah, I could give you 100 books on, on marriage, and, if, and, and none of them help you until you get the devil out first. None of it's going to help until you get the devil out, until you really forgive each other. So here's the devil. We've got to get him out. We've got to get the one who separates out of the room before we can do any more we can do any counseling that's helpful. So how do we get him out? Him. A lot of people think, y'all pray him out? No, that won't work. I'm going to rebuke him out. That won't work. You know why it won't work? Because you gave him a place. Unless you take the place away, he doesn't have to go. How do you get rid of the devil? Adrian just said it. You forgive each other. Truly forgive each other. So you guys kind of hold hands around the devil there. All right. Okay, so then I have the couple. The couple faces each other. And I say, okay, now, one at a time, he'll say, would you forgive me for such and such? And she says the words, I forgive you. It's real important you do it this way. The devil needs to hear these words. I forgive you. 
And then you say, would you forgive me for such and such? And you say, I forgive you. And what's happening? The devil's losing his place. I you. He loses his place. And then, so now, devil, you can go away now. <laughs> so the devil's gone. And now we can actually get somewhere, you know. Yeah, good move there. Good move. <laughs> okay. All right, let me tell you the assignment. Hold on a sec. Uh, here's the assignment. Now, now that we got the devil out, we can actually can make some ground. Because otherwise, you can have all kinds of principles on marriage, but if the devil's there, you're not gonna, it's not going to work. It's going to blow up. So now the devil's gone, we can get somewhere. You really forgive each other. I mean, really forgive each other. Most couples can't do it without a referee. I mean, so I, I, I'll send them on assignment. Go, to, go do this, and next week we'll meet and see how it went. And hardly any of them can do it. Maybe one out of ten, one, a couple out of ten. Because they end up, about, you know, they end up getting in an argument once they're forgiving each other. So I said, okay, sit here, and I'm going to referee it, and we're going to get through this, because if we don't get this done, I can't, nothing else I can do to help you. We've got to get the devil out. And so sometimes I'll referee once they get off track and start saying, but don't you also want to ask me to forgive you for this? No, you know, we've got certain rules we've got to follow. We've got to go slow, and you've got to just ask her to forgive you for what you did. You ask him to forgive you for what you did. That's all. That's the rules. And you say, I forgive you, until we're totally done. And what happens, because that takes great humility, is the grace of God comes down, and I watch tears go down cheeks, and I thought, now we can get somewhere. And here's the assignment. The way they win-win is Adrian must feel that Mike loves her. And the way that we win-win this way is Adrian, Mike must feel that you respect him. So here's the assignment. The next two weeks, I want you to think of 10 things a day, Mike, you can do to show Adrian you love her. 10 things a day for two weeks, and do them. And then, Adrian, 10 things a day, show Mike you respect him. 10 things a day for two weeks. I tell you, if you do this, if you do the two things I just said, forgive each other and do that, it'll dramatically change your marriage. Amen. If you don't do those things, there's lots of other things you can do that just are just not going to work without those things. So you begin to follow this one flesh principle and win-win by the wife feeling loved by the husband, the husband feeling respected by the wife. Okay, you guys can take I'll give him a hand, guys, for coming up here. Okay, so we're talking about one flesh. We're talking about being connected. We're talking about connectedness. It's one of the words that Tracy and I use all the time. We talk about being connected or we feel a little disconnected. It's an important word because we want to walk, we want to walk in that unity. Let me tell you three things that have helped us tremendously staying connected. Number one, keep courting, keep dating, keep having fun together. I think every marriage couple ought to have a date night once a week, at least. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can be cheap. Tracy and I learned to do lots of cheap dates, particularly early in our marriage. We had no money. And so, so think of something you could do when you have a date night. Our date night's Friday night. There's been a lot of ministry things that people invited me to to be part of on Friday nights that I said, I can't make it. I already have a commitment. I didn't say because I have a date with my wife because they might not think that's spiritual, but it's very spiritual. But have some time where you're going to do that. Keep courting, keep dating, keep having fun. Number two, watch the pace of your life. Every Sunday evening, Tracy and I get our calendars out and uh, say, what's going on in your week? What's going on in your week? We go through it. She'll typically go to my calendar, take out some things that were going on in my week. <laughs> That's good, though, because we want to make sure that the pace of our life works for our marriage. All right, and third, third thing that really help you stay connected is resolve conflict quickly and completely. Do not store up grievances. Once you empty out the ammunition dump, the reservoir resentment, don't put more weapons in it. Keep it clean. Quickly, as soon as there's something that's out of kilter, go ahead and do the hard work, and it's hard work, of sitting down and really walking through it and forgiving each other. And don't give the devil a place. You know, it's so important that we understand that if we're going to have fullness in our marriages, which God wants us to have, we have to have this certain order that God set up. And this order, if we do God's order... And win-win by the wife feeling loved and the husband feeling respected. And win-win, we will have fullness. And keep doing that year after year. And romance builds. And then marriage is a blast. If you don't do it that way, you get disorder. Marriage is not a blast. Let's all stand for prayer. I want to ask Aaron to come up here. I'd like to close this ministry time by just thinking from, by having just ministering to some of our marriages here. And again, my, my prayer is that we can just be family here. There is no judging. 
There's no shame in being, being honest and open in ministry time. The first service I asked, I said, for, for the marriages here that just would like a new beginning, just like a new beginning, and when uh, you're not saying that your marriage is necessarily horrible, you just, you just realize that there's some things that are in disorder you want to bring to order so you can experience fullness. If that's, if that's where you're at in your marriage, first service had come up, and we just, the whole, you know, we had, the whole place was full up here of people coming for prayer and people praying. And so I, I'm going to ask the same thing. Those of you that say, you know, I need a new beginning in my marriage, or you're saying, you know, I just, there's some things I think are in disorder that we really need to get in order. We need prayer for that so we can experience the fullness. And you just want a fresh start. Valentine's Day is tomorrow. What a great time to get a fresh start in your marriage. So if that's you, I'm going to pray in just a moment. Then just come on down. Just come on down and we're going to begin to pray for you. Let me pray. Father, I pray again that uh, you would just enable us to just be family right now. And that you're, by your spirit, you administer to couples. And just really enable them. I pray even during this time, there'd be healing. And I pray, Lord, you'd enable them to begin to see the pathway clearly to walk in order so they can walk in fullness. In Jesus' name. So if that's you, any couple that wants a new beginning, come up here real quickly. Would you slip out of your seats? Come on down. Don't hesitate. Come on, guys. Anyone else wants prayer? Slip on down quickly. We're going to pray for you. Anyone else? Quickly come. There's some room over here too. You can come over this way, guys. If you're here without your spouse and you say, I just, I just want to come and pray for marriage, you can do that. Come on down. Okay, again, we need lots of people to come pray for these folks up here. So uh, other couples, other things, come up here and just begin to lay hands on them and pray for them. Just begin to pray. And Aaron's just going to sing a song over those that have come for prayer. Just begin to pray. God gave me you for the ups and downs. God gave me you for the days of doubt. For when I think I lost my way There are no words here left to say It's true God gave me you On my own I'm only Half of what I could be I can't do without you We are stitched together And what love has tethered I pray we never undo On my own I'm only Half of what I could be I can't do without you We are stitched together and what love has tethered, I pray we never run to. God gave me you for the ups and downs. God gave me you for the days of doubt. For when I think I lost my way, there are no words here left to say it's true. God gave me you. Father, we do pray for just healing of marriages that need healing today. Lord, even as we lay hands on and pray for our brothers and sisters, Lord, would you release healing? Would you also release a revelation of understanding and how what each part they play to bring order where there's disorder? And they might experience fullness where there's emptiness. Let that come, Lord. We ask you to do that a great work in all these marriages. Also, for all of us in this church family, Lord, we just pray that we would all consider how we can walk in your order this week in our marriages and that we walk in a great, in just a great fullness because of it. I pray for those that, Lord, are heading for marriage or long to be married, Lord, we pray that you would enable them to understand ahead of time, Lord, how to walk in that order and you'd bring the right person at the right time and just the right time for them and bless them. So, Lord, we ask you that you would just cause the rest of our week to be weaker. We just continue to think through how we can walk in your order to experience your fullness. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now, before you're dismissed, I do want to say that if you're, this is your first Sunday here, I'd love to meet you over here in this welcome corner. We have Connection Corner back here where the staff can answer any questions. If you have other prayer requests, we'll have some leaders up here to pray for you. God bless you. You're dismissed. And go Bengals. <laughs>